Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Kairos. Would you guys stand to your feet? Before we sing tonight, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge that the presence of God is here, that His Spirit is in our midst as we worship and as we sing and as we listen to His voice. Would you sing this out? There's nothing worth more.
once again, I just want to welcome you to Kairos. My name is Matt, I'm one of the worship leaders here, and I'm, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, before we uh, pass the peace, I just want to uh, remind you guys, due to the nature of, of Chris's message tonight, you may find yourself doing this message, wanting prayer, trying to find out what's a way that you can get more involved in this community, maybe call this place home, or if you simply just want to give. Um, any of that, you can text the word Kairos to 615-570-3506. And I want to say that because I want to give you an opportunity that if you sense that during this message, please don't hesitate to do that. We would love the chance to, to pray for you and get you connected in this place. Um, well, now we're going to move on to, to the passing of the peace. And I know that sometimes in the summertime, a lot of you guys are new. So I want to explain this. This is what we consider to be somewhat of a sacred greeting time, as we call it, because we want this to be a place where, where we know without a doubt that the peace of God is here in this place. So how it's gonna work is I'll say, may the peace of Christ be with you, and you say, and also with you, and then we'll take a moment, turn to our neighbors, and just simply say, God's peace or peace be with you. So may the peace of Christ be with you. Let's take a second. to sing when darkness tries to roll over my boat when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know oh I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your 
continue our worship tonight through the reading of God's word. 
Our scripture tonight comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And before we read it, I would invite you to pray with me. Holy Spirit, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear? Ears to hear the pain and the hurt and the brokenness in our midst, and ears to hear the gospel that speaks louder than that. Jesus, would you go before us in this text and make a way? And together we say, Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Our text tonight comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we'll be reading verses 9 through 11. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I'll say this is the word of the Lord if you'll say thanks be to God. This is the word of the Lord. I'll say bless the Lord if you'll say oh my soul, bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. We're working on getting those bleachers fixed. Don't worry. They'll be back soon. Well, Kairos, uh, the time has come. I hope I have earned your trust as your pastor to speak with compassion and conviction about same-sex attraction. I think you'll agree with me that there are very few issues that we will not courageously confront, thoughtfully consider, and compassionately respond to with relentless prayer and sacrificial love. I hope tonight will be no different, but I know that it will, because it is different. A quick note for faithful attenders and first-timers alike, I usually love verbal feedback during the talk. In fact, I encourage it and actually need more of it, but not tonight. Tonight, due to the highly sensitive nature of the topic and the hearts of those who are affected by same-sex attraction, I humbly ask for your attention and to hold your comments until the end of the service. I've elected to treat directly from a manuscript tonight, and this is to guide the precision of my words and the percussion of my heart that beats and breaks for those who are wrestling with their sexual orientation. As we discuss same-sex attraction tonight, I have one special request for all of us. Please check your baggage. Let's all admit together that this can be a deeply personal issue and that it has all affected us in different ways. Right now, there are Christians in this room who have been incredibly hurt by other Christians who have had a very unchristian attitude in response to their own same-sex attraction or that of a friend or family member. There are Christians in this room right now who have witnessed the cultural compromise by the Christian community to uphold the biblical sexual ethic when it comes to same-sex attraction, relationships, and marriage, and therefore see a great need for Christians to aggressively fight to enforce the Christian sexual ethic in churches and the public square. There are some Christians in this room who have little to no experience with gay people and shrug it off either as a sin that those people out there deal with or perhaps just think the Bible says a lot of stuff that sounds outdated and this might be one of those things. There are some here who are also just spiritually curious who are gay or who are sympathetic with the LGBTQ community and have only seen Christians represent their God as anti-gay, uneducated, bigoted, and homophobic. The good news for all of us in the room is that Jesus, the Son of God, friend of sinners, walks with us all with full compassion and conviction, full of grace and truth. He invites us to discover his goodness and his grace, and to give ear to his invitations and challenges, his mercy and his justice alike. So let's all agree to a ceasefire. Let's acknowledge that our natural posture is often defense, and to see tonight, if not through humility and prayer, we can come together for a kind, thoughtful, articulate conversation, even if you disagree with what's being taught. For those of you who have had the privilege to pastor and pray with the ones who relentlessly struggle with what it means to be truly Christian 
a child of God, saved, redeemed, a follower of Christ, members of his church family, and yet still find themselves consistently and compulsively attracted to a member of the same sex. This talk is inspired by you. But it is not for you. It is for us, your brothers and your sisters, your mothers and your fathers, your friends and your family, your pastors and your leaders, to understand how we can better be Jesus in the flesh for you and with you full of compassion and conviction, how we can celebrate with you when you're victorious, how we can cry with you when you falter, how we can pray for you, what to say, what not to say, and how we can not just see this as something you deal with, but something our entire family will deal with together. Here's what tonight's relationship talk about same-sex attraction is not. It is not where I systematically go through every single scripture verse that addresses homosexuality and build a case brick by brick for the historic Orthodox Christian sexual ethic. The view that was affirmed by Jesus himself, that sexual intercourse is a gift from God to be enjoyed only in the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. Not this talk. It's a great talk. Um, if you want to listen to a talk like that, uh, here's what I recommend you put in your search browser, Controversial Jesus, Jesus in the Gay Community by John Tyson, a pastor in New York. Uh, it is an hour and 20 minutes comparing the progressive view of homosexuality to the historical view, and it's done with biblical precision, nuance, pastoral patience, and a humble acknowledgement of both sides of the issue. I highly recommend it. But here's the narrow focus of our talk tonight. This talk is for the person who is made in the image of God. A family member of the person who is made in the image of God or a friend of the person who is made in the image of God who says this, I'm attracted to members of the same sex. I experience not only a longing for friendship, but I also experience a sexual desire towards my own gender. Even though these desires may degree in varying degrees of intensity and compulsivity over time from person to person, they have thus come to this conclusion. After a careful reading of scripture, considerable amounts of prayer, wise counsel from trusted members of the Christian community, they have chosen to hold to the historic Orthodox Christian view that acting on my same-sex attraction is not God's original design for my sexuality. So what do we say then to those brothers and sisters who are struggling with same-sex attraction? We would like to say three things to you. You are loved. You are not alone. And there is hope. You are loved. You are not alone. And there is hope. You are loved. Biblical support. Psalm 147, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Isaiah, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Jeremiah, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Exodus, the Lord will fight for you. You only have to be still. Now hear the words of Jesus. He said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, and believe also in me. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Now remain in my love. You are loved. You are not alone. There is hope. You are not alone. You don't have to live in fear and isolation and shame. No matter what kind of pain, brokenness, or suffering we all experience, the temptation for the wounded is to say, no one will understand my pain. The temptation for us as friends can be to say, because I have not gone through this personally, I cannot help. Both are false. The most helpful and healing things my friends and counselors and pastors have done for me in the midst of my own personal brokenness and struggle is to seek to understand with the compassion and conviction of Jesus. Compassion that we all have areas that we are not as we want to be, and then to connect with me there with the love of Christ. Conviction that I am a child of God in the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, lives inside of me and you. Therefore, unity and loyalty binds us and makes us brave again. You are not alone. You are loved. You are not alone. There is hope. There is hope for healing. 
I would like for us to look at the passage that Jacoby read, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, that says, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the slanders, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. There are so many things I'd like to point out. Uh, but for the sake of time and clarity, let's just look at two. Number one, our tendency is to elevate one sin over the other. There are nine various forms of unrighteousness listed here, and I can tell you that I'm personally responsible for committing over 80% of the acts of unrighteousness listed in this passage. This passage should heighten the sweetness of the gospel and the goodness of God's grace in all of our lives, not sour our judgments into condemnation and self righteousness. For you are loved. And you're not alone, and there is hope. Two, unfortunately, we often leave the following verse out of this passage, especially when talking with our brothers and sisters who are dealing with same-sex attraction. As Dr. Robert Smith Jr. likes to say, our greatest obstacle in, no in our knowledge of the Bible is our knowledge of the Bible. And many of us become theologically guilty of pickpocketing the text. Verse 11, and that is what some of you were but you were washed you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of jesus and by the spirit of our god if it's possible i want everyone to underline one word in this passage especially those of you who have the courage to admit that you're guilty of at least three or more of the items on this list it's the greek word with very little controversy or question about how to surround its interpretation it's four short letters that contain the gospel and your hope for healing in God to his radically transformative power to change your identity. Verse 11, please underline, were. As such, were some of you. Here the verb were is in our past tense in the Greek. It is in the imperfect, active, indicative voice, which simply means this. It was continual, habitual, compulsive, repeatable behavior that was in your past but is no longer. Past tense referring to past behavior. Then we get three more words, and these are in the past tense. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Those three words are, yeah, that took a long time for me to get down. Those three words are past tense in Greek, in the aorist, refers to a once in time, only and forever event that's brought about a fundamental change in our identity. Your identity is not in your brokenness, child of God, but in the beauty he sees you with. Child of God, your identity is not in what you are prone to, but what you were purchased for. Child of God, your identity is not in your orientation. It is in your sanctification. Child of God, your identity is not in your sexual repression or your sexual obsession. It's in God's obsession with making all things new, starting with you. Why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You are loved, you are not alone, and there is hope. If we're reading this text accurately, and I believe that we are, the hope here is staggering. Paul is saying that the acts of unrighteousness listed in here were in his congregation, and that his members had participated compulsively, habitually, and regularly in the past, but were doing so no longer. As such were some of you. There is hope for healing. In Christ, there is hope for the sexually immoral to become sexually pure. In Christ, there's hope for the adulterers to learn to honor and commit and loyally love their spouse. In Christ, there's hope for idolaters to put their, one, their worship in the one true God. In Christ, there's hope for the greedy to become generous. In Christ, there's hope for the drunkard to find sobriety, the slanderers to speak graciously and truthfully. In Christ, there's hope for the swindlers to embrace honesty and integrity. And in Christ, there is hope for the homosexual to find hope and healing in Christ. But even as the amen is leaving our lips, our doubt and despair still leaves a bitter aftertaste for some of us, doesn't it? Why? Because all too many of us know that when we fight addictions or compulsions or have loved ones who have, that not everyone, including Christians, find healing this side of heaven. And such were some of you that many, many of us Christians live in the brutal daily reality of fighting for our behavior 
to catch up with our identity in Christ. But herein also lies hope. Because you are loved, you are not alone, and there is hope. Hope for suffering, Romans 8, 23 and 25. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly await the adoptions of sons and daughters for the redemption of our bodies. If we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Dr. Wesley Hill is a PhD in New Testament studies and assistant professor of New Testament at Trinity School for Ministry in Pennsylvania. Dr. Hill describes in his book, Washed and Waiting, Reflections of Christian Faithfulness and Homosexuality, about his personal journey for healing as he struggled with same-sex attraction ever since he hit puberty. Raised in a strong Christian home with a fully functioning family unit, Dr. Hill was perplexed with the cause of his same-sex attraction. Finally, while at a Christian college, after countless prayers for healing and deliverance, he could bear it no more. Alone, scared, and crumbling on the inside, he risked confiding in one of his professors for the first time in his life about his lifelong struggle. The professor listened graciously and then encouraged him to talk to one of his friends. Listen in to Wesley's words of what he remembers most about that conversation. He told me, be spiritually adventurous. I've thought about this on many occasions since that meeting, thought about it more often than I've acted on it, but it has remained with me as a ringing challenge. He said, don't be afraid to pursue multiple avenues for healing. God has used everything from support groups to therapists to contemplative spiritual directors to guide homosexual Christians towards wholeness. Maybe one or more of those avenues is for you. If God directs you to one, step out on faith. Don't let your background or your commitment to your own tradition make you fearful of joining the adventure the Holy Spirit prepares you for. What healing journey might the Holy Spirit be calling you to embark on tonight? Dr. Hill goes on to describe in his book that there are some of his friends who have found healing and restoration of heterosexual desires and who are now married. He also tells of friends gay and lesbian who are in heterosexual marriages and make it work even if they have little or no desire for sexual intercourse and still fight through same-sex attraction. And there are some of his gay friends who try to make the marriage work with a member of the opposite sex, only for it to end in divorce. This is what he says. Dr. Hill continues to pray and hope for healing, even if it only comes in the resurrection and the full redemption of his body in this earth when Jesus returns. Even if it only comes in the resurrection. And I just pause and tell you that kind of faith is staggering to me. The bravery and beauty of trusting and obeying God in the midst of unchosen and often unfulfilled longings inspires the tiny mustard seed of my faith. In the meantime, Dr. Hill says that his same-sex orientation is a very real battle that he engages every day not to act on. He's got to remind himself that there's a very real difference between being tempted and to sin and sinning. He states in his book that the Bible's very clear and uncompromising with its sexual ethic. There's only two options for Christians, marriage between man and a woman and celibacy. He's decided that celibacy, not to act upon his same-sex attractional desires, however painful, is not only obedience for him, but obedience that will ultimately be worth it. He then offers two breathtaking and incredibly courageous thoughts on that fight. One, wake up every morning and say, I am the beloved of God, and look to the cross, as N.T. Wright suggests, and see the evidence there that I am loved extravagantly and inexorably by the self-giving triune God. Two, and this is advice a friend gave him, and I believe every person in this room needs to hear this. We must call into question any notion that the supreme expression of human love is found in marriage. The ancients did not contend this, and neither does the Bible. The Old Testament suggests that there's a brotherly sacrificial love that's found outside of marriage and often greater than marriage, 2 Samuel 1.26. The New Testament does likewise. Jesus says there's no greater love than for a friend to lay down his life for a friend, John 15, 13. And is it not curious? The greatest discourse of love in the New Testament is not a discussion about marriage, but a discussion about spiritual gifts and the body of Christ 
functioning together. 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. And in Ephesians 5, sacrificial love is the model for marital love, not the other way around. Marriage is a venue for expressing love, which in its purest form exists first and foremost outside of it. I think the entire message of Dr. Hill's book can be expressed in this simple phrase. Faithfulness is never a gamble. Faithfulness to the word of God and the way of Jesus. That's never a gamble. In conclusion, I'd like to read a story of one of the young men I've had the privilege to know and pastor. I grew up in a typical Christian family and was very involved in church. As far back as I can remember, my parents and church always made it clear that there were certain people you stayed away from. I was always under the impression that those people were going to hell and there was no reason to be associated with their filth. However, when I hit puberty, I could not seem to stay away from the problem that those people the problem that those people were dealing with because in reality, I I was one of those people. I've dealt with same-sex attraction ever since. I had no one to go for help because everyone around me told me those people went to hell and there was no helping them and we just better ignore them. When college rolled around, I fought with this problem for most of my life and I hated God because of it. I knew that it was wrong, but I had no way to combat it. I felt like I was alone and I was damned to live a life that only ended in pain. I turned my back on God, and I hated myself. Despite all that, God never left my side. He was with me in the darkest of times. Not only was he there, he used it to transform me. For me, same-sex attraction is part of my story. I have to wake up every day and cry out for my Father to give me strength and perseverance to make it through. I have embraced it, but I refuse to let it define me. It is by the grace of God that I find out who I really am in him. Sometimes we can't choose our temptations, but we can choose how we respond to them. Let me underline what I hope you hear from us as a congregation and as a pastor by using another pastor's words. This was uh, a guy named Gordon um, in Boston speaking to his church about this issue. I do want to emphasize, though I I do not consider homosexuality to be worse externally than any of the sins I commit every day. In fact, it is a tribute to the infinite grace and mercy of God that the sanctuary roof stays up each day I walk into that room. In any case, we're not on a crusade to single out those who may be dealing with this issue. I have no intentions of so stressing it that many of the homosexual guests and visitors who are not interested in changing will feel put off or unwelcome, or at least no more put off and unwelcome than the many materialists who are not yet interested in changing. (laughs) On the other hand, I want to say enough that those who are trying to surrender this part of their lives to Christ will be encouraged, and also that the rest will not be misled by a culture that is increasingly allowing only one side of the discussion to be heard. Brothers and sisters who are dealing with same-sex attraction, we wish to warmly affirm you as you battle with the rest of us in repentance and faith for a lifestyle that honors the word of God and the way of Jesus. There is room for every kind of background and sinful past among the members of the church of Jesus and the bride of Christ as we learn together the way of repentance and renewed lives. You are loved. You are not alone. And there is hope. Amen. I'd like to take 120 seconds. Just pray and process through what the Lord might be doing in your heart. Regardless of the subject matter, every time we preach the Bible, we want repentance and renewal. God reveals, we respond. We change the way that we're thinking and we choose to live a different way. This is a great time for anything you need to repent of and renew your covenant vows to Jesus to remember that he holds you in his hand. It's also a time to consider, is there a spiritual adventure that the Holy Spirit is inviting you on 
to find deeper hope and healing. And then, of course, if someone comes to your mind, pray that the love of Christ would reach them.
if you're comfortable, would you put your hands out in a posture of receiving? I'll speak a prayer of blessing over us. May you discover the spiritual adventure that the Holy Spirit has for you as you uncover the places that need hope and healing the most. May you recover the compassion and conviction of Jesus as you remember that faithfulness is never a gamble. And if you don't hear another word I say, hear this, you're loved, you're not alone, and there is hope. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. You guys can stay standing. We'll sing the doxology in just a second. Never underestimate the power of prayer. We'll be up front. Love to pray with anybody who needs that. Um, There's also prayer cards in the back. We'd love to pray for you. Would you guys sing this with me? Praise God from... 